in the lane, 15, 10, touchdown, Chargers! What's up, guys? Welcome into a special edition of Chargers Weekly, live from Indianapolis 2024 Scouting Combine. As always, joined by Matt Muddy Smith in the flesh, though, yeah, brother. I know, exactly. Not uh, not on a couple TV screens. In Indianapolis, <laughs> in the, uh, the radio row, if you will, area, all the teams surrounding us. And um, this is Tuesday that we're doing this. So we had the Joe Ortiz uh, presser a little bit earlier, kind yep. of the one highlight. Jim Harbaugh not going to speak to the media in terms of people from the Chargers that will be doing Jim it. Jim said enough February 1st. 100%. So this has been, and you know, to, to Jim's, uh, to quote him, this is the time that Joe is Batman. So uh, this is when Batman is doing all the press, and, and that's what Joe was doing earlier today. Had his presser, did the the CBS, the NBC, the Sirius XM, all of those rounds. Had a chance to catch up with him a, a little bit after his presser. And I think it's worth just sort of setting the tone, what we heard today. And, and look, it's misinformation. It's misdirection. It's an agenda. There's so many things that go into what a team wants to present uh, and I think Joe did quite a bit of that from the podium today. He did 7 a.m. Pacific, so it was early. A lot of you guys probably watched that on a replay. But, you know, first of all, Joe's not going to tell us what he's going to do. No. Okay, there was a lot of questions about the cap and Keenan and Mike and Joey and Khalil and what they're going to do there because that kind of sets the table for free agency. Uh, he did, I think, unprompted, talked about the wide receiver depth in the yeah. uh, in the draft. Somebody asked them about the uh, the offensive tackle and offensive line depth and Obviously said good in, in both those fronts, but at number five overall, there's so many different things that they can do. Um, and what J.J. McCarthy and Michael Penix and Bo Nix and, and the guys outside the top three quarterbacks, what they do this week, Money, could kind of dictate what other teams are thinking about the quarterback and maybe trade up for five. Yeah, you know, I've done I don't know how many combines uh, going way back to when, actually when NFL Network really first jumped in with both feet unfortunately they've gotten out of the pool and they don't do nearly as much as they used to yep. but I used to sit on the field and I remember in the Andrew Luck RG3 draft that nobody wanted to throw and you know Andrew Luck went you know obviously RG3 was going to run the 40 and Andrew Luck did everything and, and all of but he didn't want to throw and so what my takeaway from that draft was Russell Wilson started throwing and he started spinning it and then next thing you know, Her cousins, Brandon Whedon gets out there and starts throwing. And he wasn't supposed to throw. And Ryan Tannehill, Ryan Tannehill was hurt, so he couldn't. But then Kirk Cousin gets out. And next thing you know, you've got this competition. And this quarterback competition emerged. And so what I think we're going to see is while a lot of people are opting out of the drills because they're locked into the top ten and perhaps there's nothing for them to gain in Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison and obviously Caleb Williams – and, and Jaden Daniels, I don't know if we've heard from Drake May yet or not. I don't know I, if he's throwing or not. He, yeah. he may be. He may be. But uh, And I, retweet, I retweeted uh, Dane Brugler, who does it for The Athletic. He said, um, yeah, J.J. McCarthy's got the spotlight. Like, it's all him. He, we, we've heard he's going to ace the interviews, and he now has an opportunity to go out there and put on a show and and – perhaps improve his draft status of where we thought he might go. And, and I bring it up because I think that is best case scenario for the Chargers is there are four quarterbacks, not three. Because I just don't – it's hard for me to envision – I've said this repeatedly on the pod. I just don't envision a scenario where it's not one, two, three, where it's not Drake May, Jaden Daniels after Caleb Williams in, you know, whichever order. I ultimately think it will be Drake May second, Jaden Daniels third. But I just – to me, that makes too much sense. It, it's just it lines up too well. They're all way too talented not to go one, two, three. And now you got to figure out, you know, and, and what Dane had, had tweeted out was he feels like there is enough buzz that it's beyond just trying to create something that one of these teams in the top 13, if you cap it at the Raiders and Broncos there, at, you know, Vikings, Broncos, Raiders in that order, one of those teams is going to want J.J. McCarthy. And they're probably going to have to trade up to get him, and that's that's what we're looking for. So if, if we're looking at uh, – obviously, we know the Broncos and Raiders are looking for a quarterback, but the teams that I think that we would prefer to trade with are teams like the Falcons at number eight overall. Even the Giants at six, 
to move up a spot to, to ensure that you get the quarterback that you want because Daniel Jones may not be the guy beyond 2024. Maybe you pick up an extra second there, and, and then you can yeah. kind of build in a crew from there. But I, I'm just looking at you know seeing Raheem Morris and Terry Fontenot and those guys. They were here. Um, you, you could tell that they feel like they're a quarterback away, and maybe that is a J.J. McCarthy or yeah. a Michael Or maybe Penix. it's a Kirk Cousins. Or maybe it's a you Kirk know, Cousins. That's the thing. It's a question of you know free agency is going to impact – which of those teams, you know, I was talking with, with Popper a little earlier, you know, we were breaking out the old Jimmy Johnson trade chart and trying to figure it out. And he was saying, oh, I'd rather have a next year's number one from the Falcons instead of this year's number two. And to my point, I said, if that's, you know, what we're talking about, what I, I would then prefer to go down to 11. With Minnesota. With Minnesota so I can get the one and the two. Because if you're going 11 to five, you're going to have to give up your two and you're going to have to give up next year's one. And, I, and that's where I start to question, you know, how much can you really get for J.J. McCarthy? I don't, I don't know if a team would be comfortable giving up their first two picks in this draft and their, their number one next year. Now, if you're, you know, you think about what the, the Texans did and all the incoming that they took for trading back up to get Will, Will Anderson because, you know, D'Amico Ryans believed this is going to be the quarterback of our defense. This is going to change our culture. This is going to set the tone. And he was right because the number one that he traded for Will Anderson was number 25 overall or 26 overall this year, wherever that one comes in uh, that that Arizona ends up getting in lieu of Will Anderson at number three overall. So I, I think it's, again, it, it just takes one team. And, and it's a team that maybe has that vision that J.J. McCarthy is that special that can do the Chargers that favor of getting that extra top 100 pick, maybe even two extra top 100 picks if you don't want to hold them up for a a one next year. So if you trade back with the Falcons at eight, you could probably still get a Dunze. I disagree. Or neighbors. Do you think all three are are gone before seven? I just – a Dunze is going to put on a show. Like I've – I've talked to enough people there. He is going to put on a show. He's going to probably run a sub four, four, and he's going to run it at six foot two, 215 pounds. And he's going to, he is going to light the freaking drills on fire. So that's the thing. Okay. And so if that's the case, you got four quarterbacks gone and you have all three wide receivers. Well, three, I think, I think you're guaranteed three. And I just, I feel like, yeah, I feel like a Dunze neighbors and Harrison are probably going to be the next three guys off the board unless the team wants to trade up. I, I think that's what you're going to see is quarterback, 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 wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver, unless somehow McCarthy works his way into that. So if that's the case, then yes, you could trade back to eight and perhaps get yourself either neighbors or a dune say, I just, you know, if you look at the Titans and you think about how it's it's one of the worst offensive lines in football, it'd be very hard for them to pass on a, on a Joe Alt or or a Fashanu, someone to set, at least get them on track on their offensive line. That's just kind of the one wild card in that that could then end up seeing you get one of the wide receivers to slip. But, I, again, I go back to what Joe said, Joe Hortiz said at the presser, and that's it's a really deep wide receiver class. Yeah. And I just think there's more value to me just knowing what the premium of a position is. And, you know, we, we talk, I think we talked about this last week, Chris, where, you know, when you're – when you have the same great, you know, if, if you can, if you've got your horizontal, you've got your horizontal boards, right? So it's position by position. So here's your tackles, here's your wide receivers, here's your tight ends, here's your corners. And then you've got your verticals of how you rank each of those position groups. And then typically on a board over here, you'll have your vertical 150. So if I'm looking at this vertical 150 and I've got all my grades, you know, here, here's a 6'9", a 6'7", this guy's a 6'4", this guy's a 6'2", and I'm now I'm getting into the fives. You've got to think about what the gap is. But on your wide receiver rankings, on your corner rankings, on your tackle rankings, to me those are the three big positions for this team in this draft, right? And that's what's going to dictate. Hey, if we don't, if we don't, you know, draft Roma Dunsey at number five, how do we feel about Troy Franklin? How do we feel uh, about one of the Texas receivers? About Polk from Washington? About, you know, Thomas isn't going to slide into the second round, but like that's what you got to start asking yourself. Versus. How do we feel about this tackle versus one of Fuaga, Fashanu, Alt, Latham, you know, that group that we feel good about getting, even if we trade all the way back to to 13 or, or 15 or something like that. So it seems like, I don't know if there is a consensus to tackle. Maybe it's Alt. 
You know, I, I feel like if you had to poll most people, yeah. it would be alt at, at number one in terms of tackle. But when you get to eight or ideally 11, you're in Brock Bowers' territory too there. You are. Like, so, so maybe you can get a, a guy like Brock Bowers. But before you even try to put that puzzle together, Joe's got some, some cap issues to deal with. Yes. He's starting with Keenan Allen and Mike Williams, and how is that going to shake out? And how does that dictate how you rework the wide receiver room? Uh, Joey and Khalil, who are you going to put on the other side of Thule next year? Are, are both guys going to be gone? Is one guy going to stick around? Those are all these questions that are going to be answered the next couple of weeks, then free agency, and then based on what you did in free agency, I think you can really start to put the pieces of the draft together. So, so uh, what I got a lot of you know, a lot of correspondence with the the, ki- the cap spiking as much as it did. Nobody expected it to go up thirty million bucks. Mm-hmm. They they maybe expected four to five million. Chargers are still in fifty five million dollars a cap hell that they've got to restructure. Uh, thirty million bucks means they are now only thirty five million dollars of cap. But so they're like, well, does that you know? And a lot of people are asking, does that mean they can keep Joey? Does that mean they can keep Khalil and maybe even Mike Lynch? Yeah, it does. But the first thing that I thought of is that now opens that trade door a lot more than it had before. When you add the $30 million, now maybe there is a team that did not anticipate having that $30 million bucks that can immediately plug in Joey Bosa's $30 million, and they're happy to give you a, a day two pick, you know, a second or a third. Or Khalil's the missing piece exactly. for a year. Exactly, or Khalil, and now you can trade a third or a fourth for Khalil Mack, and that completely changes the dead cap situation for the Chargers. Now you'll probably have to maybe take a little bit of that money on and however much you take on can determine, you know, what kind of pick you're getting back. But that's the first thing I thought of is is now where maybe you had a very limited number of people that would be willing to engage in a trade for one of those players. Maybe now they're open to it. They're, they're a little more open to it. So, And maybe now you can restructure Mike and make it a little more friendly and cross your fingers and – and hope he stays healthy and, you know, maybe – I can think – the thing that's interesting about Mike is, like, I get what they were doing by by playing him inside and trying to move Keenan outside and let's just mix up our looks and let's pressure the defense more. But just Mike's just a straight-line runner, man. He's a straight-line 50-50 guy. He's so tall. And when you put him inside, you just – you invite those sort of injuries to happen with all that traffic in there. So – I think that's one where it'd be an interesting discussion. Like, hey, was this a product of maybe as talented as he is, we get what you're thinking, but ultimately you don't want him in that mix in there. That's that's where bad things happen. So it'll, it'll be interesting. Getting the extra $30 million bucks, and that was the big breaking news from this last week, certainly changes the discussion, but I think it changes it on both sides. Yeah. Teams that are willing to give up draft capital for your players and – what can the Chargers now do with these guys? Because of the wide receiver depth, though, it also lends the question of, hey, do you just kind of reset Justin Herbert's weapons now, right? Get get guys on rookie deals. Quentin's already in his rookie deal year two, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk to Sam Monson about Quentin and a ton of draft stuff here coming up. Uh, but can you kind of reset – what Justin's weapons look like with a Brock Bowers, with a, with a Neighbors or a Dunze, um, with some of these guys in the second and third round because of the depth and, and really have these guys on cost-controlled deals while Justin's contract is so, you know, gigantic. You know, you, you kind of reset the market uh, in terms of who you, who you have at your pass catchers, retool the running game, and then defensively, you know, we'll get into some of the maybe the Michigan guys that you can get in the draft and, and right. what you'll do in free agency. But I just think it's an interesting conversation, um, and nothing can really be said until we know what Keenan and Mike look like 2024 and beyond. I think that – and there's also a, a name that's as interesting, if not more, and that's Josh Palmer. You know, if you want to try to do an extension with him right now – and I look, I believe Josh is a top – easily a t- he can be a two uh, you know if he's a one he can be a Keenan like one in on, on an offense right so to me that's an interesting one you know that no one's talking about he's coming up on the last year of his deal do you want to avoid him going into an unrestricted free agency or is Josh Palmer that perfect comp pick guy where you think he's going to have a big year he goes into free agency coming off a monster year yeah. gets signed elsewhere and now you're looking at a third round comp pick because he's a 1000 plus yard receiver with eight plus touchdowns and he signs a big money deal somewhere that else that probably makes more sense because these guys haven't had they, they haven't gotten their hands on Josh yet they, it, they've seen right. the tape but, exactly you know, so that's that's the question though is that more of a value than 
hey, Josh, how about how about three years, 38 million bucks? How's that sound to you? You know, three years, 35 million bucks. You know, let's get a little bit of money in your pocket. You're not going to break the bank with a $30 million a year wide receiver type contract, but we're comfortable enough. And now you've got Quentin on a rookie deal. You've got Palmer at an incredibly affordable number. Keenan at a spot in his career where clearly he's not going to have the same, you know, if you just keep his number where it is, now that's up, and, and you've completely reset it. Similar to what Tom did with Austin, right? Where he, right. he kind of said, hey, yeah. you know what? We want you a charger. We're going to give you yeah. a nice little bump. It's 28 million bucks over four years. It's not 12 million a year, but it's you're set for life. Yeah. You know, it's generational money. Then he outplayed it, and then yeah. that's what happened. Yeah, but. That's what happens. <laughs> exactly. Um, hey, uh, we have a great interview with Sam Monson, PFF, coming up in, in tons of interviews all week. But without further ado, here's Sam. All right, Money, as promised, uh, Sam Monson, PFF, joins us here live from Indianapolis. And, Sam, uh, we, we've talked about the Chargers at nauseum, obviously, with Joe Hortiz just speaking at the podium. Uh, your thoughts on this team now with Harbaugh, Hortiz, and Toe and the number five overall pick? Yeah, I mean, I think they're going to be one of the most interesting teams in the NFL because of that, right? New regime, one of the most compelling names in the NFL at the head of the whole thing. Um, and draft capital. You know, they're picking up at the top, and they're picking up at the top with without a quarterback need, you know, in a draft where quarterbacks could go one, two, three. Um, so they're going to have this prime pick to get one of the best, one of the top blue chip players in the draft, probably, you know, at a position of need. We heard uh, in his intro presser, you know, comp picks was a, was a big theme of Joe Ortiz. You know how Baltimore's drafted all these years, Sam. So some have described it as top heavy, blue chip at number five. What do you think makes the most sense for when you look at the Chargers roster? If there is a willing partner, you can pick up an extra maybe second, maybe even a future one, depending on how far you go back. Would you take the blue chip at five, or would you be looking to, say, get somewhere inside the top 15? Yeah, I mean, it always depends a little bit uh, exactly who's there. You know, I, I think generally speaking, they're going to be in a position where – they can get one of the best wide receivers in this draft. And if you assume Marvin Harrison Jr. will be the number one guy, he'll go three, he'll go four, he'll probably be gone by five. Um, in any other year, I think Malik Neighbors or Roma Dunze would be wide receiver one. You know, it's only because Marvin Harrison Jr. is there that those guys probably won't be this year. Um, so, you know, you could look at it and say, well, we're drafting wide receiver two or three at this spot. But I, I think in any other year, you're drafting wide receiver one, right? You're drafting right. a top-tier talent at that spot. So that's not to say you don't move off that. If somebody's willing to offer something crazy um, and you don't have to drop back that far, you know, maybe you could get the other one, right? Maybe you could draft Malik Neighbors at five and Roma Dunze at nine or ten or whatever, and, and I think that's still a deal you should take if that's on the table. But, you know, I, I think either way they're in a good situation. Sam, when you look at five, let's say they move out, right? The difference between a Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze as opposed to a, a Brian Thomas or some of these other wide receivers, knowing that Justin Herbert is your quarterback. Because right. typically, you know, if you have a blue-chip wide receiver at five, you probably want to take that guy. But because Justin's your quarterback, because you can accrue some other picks, what's the, the gap between those first three guys and then four through whoever? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, there's, there's two different ways of looking at it, right? There's the let's evaluate them all as prospects. Let's put them through the grading system. Let's sort of figure out where we think they live. And then there's let's remember P Puka Nakua, exactly. who's the best wide receiver <laughs> in, you know, in the rookie class. And all of this might be irrelevant. Like, we might be talking about a guy in the sixth round that's the best guy in this draft as well. So I, I think when you look at them, there is a gap between uh, Adunze, Neighbors, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr., and the next group. Um, I'm higher on Oregon's Troy Franklin than a lot of people. I think he's closer to that trio than, than most people do. Um, but after that, I do think that, that you, you see a drop-off. They're just not as – it's not that they don't have the skill set. They, they're just not as consistent. They don't have the, the clean bill of health in terms of all areas of, of being a, a high-level prospect. But I do think this is a really strong wide receiver draft class – it's deep as well, and, you know, given how much success we're seeing of wide receivers just come into the NFL, hit the ground running, translate really well, and doing it all the way through recent drafts, not just Puka Nakua, but, you know, Tank Dell was a third rounder, looked amazing before he broke his leg. I think if you can get more swings at the, at the bat, take it.
Yeah, yeah it's, you know, we, we were at Joe Hortiz's presser a little bit earlier, and I don't think he was uh, – it wasn't solicited. I think he just offered it up. He talked about the depth of the wide receiver group and yeah. how every single year since he's been doing this, there are more and more because of the style of play of college football. So – I don't know if that's an indicator if he's planting a seed, but I think for the folks listening, because, you know, they want the, the shiny toy. They want the running back, the tight end, the wide receiver. They don't get too excited about offensive line. But in listening to Greg Roman and listening to Jim Harbaugh, even Joe Hortiz, that to me, that is being signaled, that, like, that's yeah. sort of what they would like to do. So in all of your evaluations at, at PFF, Sam, how deep is this tackle class? If you can think back historically – how often do you see top tackles drafted outside of the first round? Because right. for me, I feel like we just don't see that. So I think this is a deeper tackle class than it usually is. Um, since PFF has been grading college football, so that goes back to 2014, I, I feel like it's been a very barren stretch of offensive tackles coming into the NFL generally. And multiple times we've kind of looked at the landscape pre-draft and we're like, there aren't good tackles in this draft. Like, where are all these guys? This is a better year than that, and it's deeper than that as well. So it's a reasonably good offensive tackle draft class, but no position is like wide receiver at the moment where right. there's just so many of these guys so deep. Like we're going through, you know, doing our draft study, and you're like 20 guys deep, and you're finding receivers that you still like, you know. And then like in the top 100. Yeah, and even then you're getting beyond that, there's people like, wow, well, you've got to watch this guy. And like I haven't even looked at him yet. I mean, Puka Nakua last year was somebody that – the, the PFF data had identified that, that the tape was good, yeah. obviously, and you know we, we didn't really get deep enough into his tape to sort of fully appreciate what he was. But it's not like he wasn't the guy that, like, there was no evidence that said he was going to be good yeah, the next level. It was all there. Yeah. We just didn't get that deep. Yeah. Like, that's what the wide receiver draft class is looking like these days. Um, so, I, and I love what the Green Bay Packers tend to do as an organization in terms of, okay, we need a wide receiver – we're not going to take one. We're going to take two or three. Mm. And then maybe it's not the guy that we thought was the best one ends up being the guy. Like Dontavian Wicks was their best uh, rookie wide receiver. So I, I love that as a strategy as well. Maybe we don't take a, a receiver at five. Maybe we trade down. But then we're going to draft two or three of them, and one of the guys is going to end up being the player that we needed to be. Just stick with wide receiver. Obviously, the Chargers have decisions to make on Mike Williams and Keenan Allen. And, you know, where are you removed from drafting Quentin Johnston in right. the first yeah. round? What was the grade that you guys had on Quentin? Because forgive me, I don't have it up, but just drops were obviously the, the problem with Quentin this year. Can you see him rebounding in a new offense under Jim Harbaugh? Um, I think there's a skill set there that can work. I think he's clearly a limited wide receiver. He's not, you know, a complete total package, uh, a true number one guy. But he does have things that he does really well. He's big, he's strong, he's fast. Um, the weirdly, the best thing that he does is catch a hitch, immediately turn up field, and use, like, direct line acceleration yeah. and speed and that kind of thing. I was a lot lower than him on him than most people. Given last year's draft class, it was really deep, but it, did, it wasn't as top-heavy as this year's group. Um, so I still think he belonged, you know, in the top four or five guys. Uh, I, I think I still had him number three. I'm, I'm perpetually kicking myself that I didn't have the guts – to put Tank Dell above him in my rankings. I had Johnson three, Tank Dell four, and I couldn't bring myself to put a five foot eight, 160 pound guy ahead of Quentin Johnson. I was like, no, he must be better than that. Um, but I, I think we saw last season, you know, there, there's not enough to his game yet. But wide receiver is a position where a very flawed type of player can still have a really good role because you don't have to be a complete player. You can do three things. And if all you can do is three things, we can find a way of making that work. Now, you can't have a whole receiving core that can only do that because that then the, the jigsaw puzzle doesn't work. But if we have one guy that is very limited, is very flawed, but can do a couple of things really well, we can fit that in. So I think there's still a role to be played for Johnson, but you're going to need to build the receiving core around him and then slot him into the puzzle. Yeah, the worst thing was that Mike Williams got hurt because if there's right. one thing that Quinton wasn't, it was Mike Williams. Yeah. Uh, tracking the ball over his head, catching the ball, that, that's just you know deep balls in that particular situation. Just was it, That was his absolute weakness. Yeah, and now and you needed to push him into a role exactly. that he just wasn't suited for. Yeah. You uh, you mentioned the the nugs. You know, you guys, you and Steve on the on the pod always come up with, with players that you identify <laughs> that other people, you know, may be lower on. The one that I think of that Steve just would – pound and you know good for him was Christian Barmore like he was yeah. just Barmore bar nonstop. who is it this year have you identified the Sam player that 
that you are much higher on than everyone else? Um, I think Jalen Polk might be that guy, the, the Washington wide receiver. Yeah. Everyone's focusing on Adunze. Jalen Polk was a guy that jumped off the tape as much as Adunze when you were watching Washington tape, I think. When I went through and did the sort of whole wide receiver group, I was a little bit less high on him than I thought I was going in just because of the sort of highlights that I caught. But he's a really good player, I think, and he's good at the right things. Like, he separates well. He gets open. He understands how to, how to beat man and zone coverage. And he's sort of bigger. He's bigger and stronger than people think he is. Like, he, he gets kind of pegged as this smaller slot guy that's not Roma Dunze. But he's like 6'2", 210. Like he's Seems prototypical. <laughs> yeah, it's like prototypical wide receiver size. So I, I think he's going to be a guy that I'm higher on than most people. 18 Michigan guys are here. Yeah. 18 Michigan guys are here. The fact that Jim Harbaugh is the head coach, if you had to identify maybe like two or three that would fit really well based on Jesse Minter being the D.C. and some of the needs that the Chargers have, who would those guys be, even early, mid-rounds, whatever? I mean, I think the most obvious one is actually sticking with wide receivers. It's, it's Roman Wilson. Mm. Like he – People are talking about him going to run extremely quickly at the Combine as well. He had an amazing senior bowl um, during the practices as well. And his tape is good. Like, you look at the tape, you're not, again, like Puka Nakua. It's not hidden. Like, this guy has had a really good college career, um, and it fits a need. And it means that maybe you don't uh, either don't use number five on one of those receivers or you come back again in the mid-rounds and grab a guy like Roman Wilson and, and let's double, double up and add two playmakers instead of one. What about defense? Yeah, I mean, defense, I, I think that group is insanely good. <laughs> Obviously, we saw it a year ago. I, and, you know, the Chargers have got some holes, so I think they could definitely dip into the Michigan well and grab a couple of those guys. Yeah, it's not a sexy, but, I, you know, it's not – maybe it will be a 40, but Chris Jenkins is going to put on a show. Yeah. Like, he is going to put on a show at the Combine, and, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if he snuck into the first round when it's – I mean, I know the measurables aren't quite there. He's not quite as tall, but, my God, he's just going to explode on that field. Yeah, and he's, he's just a great example of a guy where I don't think the measurables mean that much. Right. You know, his tape is, is amazing. He's just a good football player. We know what his dad was able to do in the NFL. Yeah. He's going to be good. The, um, I want to go back to the tackles because I, I just, I don't know, I have this feeling that that's, and I don't know if it's interior or if it's a center in the second round. If they add a second second rounder and use those two to trade back into the first round if Powers Johnson is available. Right. But just kind of where you have, uh, where you, you and everyone at PFF, if you want to, you know, I guess speak for them as well, have kind of the tackles stacked. It, knowing that they've got, an, and I believe that, that Rashawn Slater can, can be the best offensive lineman in football at some point in his career. So if he's stacked, if he's locked in at left, if you're drafting the right tackle, or let's just say you trade back far enough where Powers Johnson becomes a serious conversation. Right. What do you see on that right side? Are you comfortable in what you've seen from Alt to flip him to the right side? Is it Fuaga because he's your natural sort of road grader, right? Like, what would you do at right tackle? Or would you take that center knowing that Corey Lindsley's probably going to retire? Right. I mean, Paris Johnson, really the only, red, the only red flag negative about him is injuries, you know, which right. is a question mark. His tape is insane. His production is nuts. He, he's going to be an amazing player as long as he's healthy. But that is a factor. You know, he got injured at the Senior Bowl. He's, right. he's an injury question mark at this point. Um, the right tackles are interesting. Like, I think generally if you're taking a player in the draft, you can probably assume that you can move him to right tackle day one with no issue, right, as, as a general default starting position. Now, not everybody is going to be able to make that switch. There are going to be guys where it just doesn't work for some reason. You know, they're incredibly one-sided, and it just doesn't function sw swapping them over. But generally speaking, I think it does. And as long as you do it day one, it's not a problem. Right. The, the problems start to occur, I think, when you take a guy that's played one side – you know, in the NFL for a long period of time, and then you start messing around, asking him to flip sides. That, I think, can become a problem. But, you know, I, I, don't, I think now the two positions are the same. It's, it's not that, you know, in traditional senses, you would, if you go back a few years, you would look at Olofashnu from Penn State and Fuaga from Oregon State, and you're like, prototypical left tackle, prototypical right tackle. You know, footwork, pass protection, little bit of a weakness maybe as a run blocker, and then the other side, you've got road grading monsters as, as right. a run blocker, and if he has a weakness, it's going to be in the pass pro side. I don't think that exists anymore. They just happen to fall into the stereotypes that, that work. That being said, if, if you've got two guys that are equal, take the guy that's already playing that position because yep. you don't have that variable. You're not, right. you're not adding an extra question mark to it. So, you know, I, I think all three of those guys are elite-level tackle prospects. Fashnu's 
pass protection. His footwork is insane. Um, I think Joe Alt from Notre Dame is like the best composite where he's just good at everything. He's a massive body, like 6'8". He's just huge, great technician, strong. Um, and then Fuaga is this guy who he's got the offensive line equivalent of that, the touch of death that, that yes. MMA guys talk about, right, <laughs> yeah. where he hits you, you're it's done. Over. Right. He gets his hands on you in the run game, forget it. You're out of the play. Game over. Um, and he's good enough as a pass blocker. He's right. not this, like, liability at that side. So – I think any of those guys are honestly in play. Maybe not quite at five. I, I, maybe I'm just being falling into that stereotype trap, but Fuaga at five feels a little rich. The other two guys I think are definitely live options there. Yep. Sam, the two hot names among Charger fans, we read about it every week. It's Brock Bowers and it's Malik Neighbors. Yeah. Give me your 30-second elevator pitch on each guy. I mean, Malik Neighbors is incredibly good. He's a technician. He's got prototypical size, speed play after the catch ability the only thing that scares me at all about neighbors is he doesn't use his hands at the line of scrimmage to defeat press he like shrugs his shoulders and tries to get around press you can't do that in the nfl like that's gonna have to be fixed but it, it's a fix that can be made it's not a difficult thing so that's the only thing i think that's any in any way shape or form uh, a negative or a concern for him um, brock bowers incredible playmaker He's undersized for the tight end position. Um, I think he'll end up weighing about what he's listed at, which is like 240, 245, something like that. I don't know if he actually is that size. I mean, we were at the Super Bowl. There's a picture of him standing wild. next to Gronk. Yeah, we talked those about are that. Not, those <laughs> human beings are not the same size, right? Very big difference. But he's more of a move tight end. He's more of a receiving type player. I think the biggest thing working against him is, is the Kyle Pitts thing hasn't worked out yet, yeah. right? And the, the, the last time we took a tight end this high, it hasn't quite all come together. He's got that kind of ability, though. He's an amazing route runner. He's great after the catch. He's great uh, just generally receiving. He should be a top 10 pick, maybe top five. Teams are scared away from that because of the size and the fact that the last guy we took that high hasn't been a superstar. Last thing, uh, Sam, we'll let you go. We appreciate it. Um, Running back, I know, is is fallen out of favor. It's not as sexy. You had a nice run last year with Jameer Gibbs and, and B. John Robinson. Does not seem like we have that this year. I don't know how much work you guys have done already. I know the draft's a little ways away on running back, but Eckler's a free agent. Joshua Kelly's a free agent. Isaiah Spiller has found himself inactive on game days. Thoughts about the, the backs in this draft and maybe where, if you need a bell cow and that's the route you're going to go, where you should start thinking about drafting one and if that person exists. It's funny. This is like the perfect analytics draft for running backs, right? Because there is no first-round draft right. pick. There's no B. John Robinson in this draft. But there's a ton of guys that, that in the mid-rounds I think are going to be good NFL players. And it's, you know, it's where analytics says that's where you start looking for right. running backs anyway. So I think in a way it's a perfect draft for that kind of thing. There's no consensus, I don't think, in terms of who the number one, number two guy is. I think Blake Corum from Michigan – is that works. a a perfect uh, like he's my number one back in this draft. I think he's the best guy. Last year wasn't as good coming off that knee injury, but you go back and watch the 2022 tape. I have a play that I tweeted the last couple of days. It's just ridiculous. Like there's a freeze frame where there's four or five guys around him, and he just makes a cut, goes underneath them all, and scores. Like has it from 50 yards away. There's a lot of Austin Eckler in his tape. So you know if you're trying to replace that guy with the Michigan connection. I, he's an amazingly explosive player. Maybe he doesn't have the top end speed. You know, he hits the rev limiter pretty quickly once he gets away from people. But it's kind of like the Barry Sanders thing, right? Like, he, you might catch him from behind 80 yards into the play, but at that point he's right. 80 yards downfield, <laughs> yeah. and who cares? Blake Corms, I think, similar. Like, you might get him, but he'll be 50 yards away from the line of scrimmage at the time you did. Um, so he's great. Jonathan Brooks from Texas is a lot of people's number one, but he's coming off a knee injury, and if you need him to play day one and be the starter, maybe that's not the route you want to go. But I also think there's a ton of guys lower down that are amazing sleepers. Um, Will Shipley from Clemson I think was an amazing player, has great vision, incredibly shifty. Reminded me a little bit of Christian McCaffrey in terms of there's so many plays where it looks like he's about to take a massive shot and then somehow just takes a slight step, right. slight roll, and just gets beyond it and keeps going. Um, he could be a, a great sort of mid-round sleeper that ends up being like a, a, a bell cow type of player quite early. All right, I know I said last thing, but uh, I got to get a, what I believe is uh, you might be able to, to deem this racist because um, – <laughs> uh, Great, perfect start. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. Coming right at you. Um, watch we, the Six Nations. Inter interview's been great so far, <laughs> exactly. buddy. Let's just stop it now. Did you, uh, did you watch Six Nations on Netflix? Did you watch the yeah, yeah, documentary? Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you – how – like – where do you come out on uh, people asking you about Ireland rugby 
and expecting you to be an expert in that. Are you? Do you love Ireland rugby? No, well, do you love Six Nations? What did you make of it? I mean, it? look, expert is a word that gets people into trouble. I yes. know what I'm talking about <laughs> when it comes to Irish rugby. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I, I thought that documentary wasn't great. <laughs> it was. I figured. They didn't, they didn't get a ton of access, and they didn't really – do anything new and it's from a tournament that happened a year ago right. so it's like eh, what am i getting out of this they also so a lot of the personalities you know that they zoomed in on as the sort of focal point were boring as hell people yes. so that didn't help uh that being said the six nations is going on right now ireland are three for three we're gonna win it again hopefully we're ideally gonna get a back-to-back -back grand slam and therefore all is right with go. the world and, and we just don't mention the World Cup that happened between those things. <laughs> how big of a, like if you could put it in NFL terms, how big of a star uh, was, I, I forgot his name, the guy that Louis just Louis Reesamit? Yeah, how big of a star was he in that particular sport in Ireland? Uh, so he, he's, he was arguably the best Welsh player um, in, their, in their nation. He's one of the biggest, youngest stars in the, the kind of northern hemisphere uh, rugby He's, you know, as big as it gets in terms of a young up-and-coming superstar, like, on the scene. In NFL terms, we're talking B. John Robinson. We're wow. talking, like, a legit superstar. Un what he's doing is, is unprecedented. Guys have tried to make that switch before. Nobody at his level, at his age, has tried to That's do that before. That's the difference. Yeah. He's not coming over at 30. Right. He's, he's 23, I think, now. He's rugby yeah. to try to play NFL He's football. 23. I mean, he was playing for Gloucester in, in England. He could have walked to France where all the money is or Japan where all the money is and had, like, he could have been one of the top five best-paid players in the world. Instead, he's taking a run at this, yeah. knowing that even if it doesn't go well, he can come back at 25 and still have that deal waiting for him. Right Sam, on. Sam, before you go, pub the PFF tools because we've been doing mock draft simulators and, and oh, all, the, all the fun stuff on PFF. Tell the fans. Yeah, mock draft simulator. You can go there, play uh, GM to your heart's content. I think 30MDS is the promo code for 30% off that we as go. well. So you can get in on the, on the cheap and spend your entire offseason – uh, fixing your team with the mock draft sim. You want to do it hey, real quick? February 27th, uh, the Chargers pick who? Number five. I think they end up with neighbors. I think that's the most likely one. Yeah. Neighbors or trade down are my two. Yep. Here we go. Uh, and we're going to start it. Three rounds. Mock nice. draft. Ready? Go. Here we go. <laughs> uh, let's see. We are on the clock. We've got neighbors, alt, adunze. Fuaga. Well, let's just leave it between Alt Neighbors and Adunze. Well, he just said well, Neighbors. He said it. Yeah, we got to go Neighbors. So you want to go Neighbors. Yeah. All right, so we're drafting Neighbors, and here we go. Charger fans will be happy with that. Yeah, they're going to love you. Second <laughs> round, uh, we are looking at, let's see, uh, boy. You go Chop Robinson, Edge, Ooh, opposite Thule. I like That'd that. That'd be interesting. Do we have a uh, – now you can get your tackle here mm -hmm. in the uh, the Bruce Feldman freak list. I would go one of those edge rushers, Chop Robinson or Darius. I Robinson. like Chop. Chop's a Big Ten guy. Jim's Jim's face Chop. All right. Or so. hang on, wait, 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 wait. What? How can we possibly? <laughs> how can we possibly leave JJ McCarthy <laughs> exactly. on the board, on board. with Jim Harbaugh <laughs> saying he's the number one player in the draft? All right, we're drafting Chop. Whoops, didn't mean to open up the profile, which is always great, though, just to make sure we're drafting the right guys. So we draft Chop, and now we get to the third round. We have Need uh, on the offensive line. We oh, we got Junior Colson there. There we Coulson. go. Colson, take yeah. – uh, yeah, run him there up. We uh, there we go. That's where our Michigan run starts. Easily. And uh, Done. Dayon Henley and, and, and Junior moving forward. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, it's Nailed fun. It. We, uh, we always tell people to check out the Mock Draft Simulator. We do it every week on the pod. Sam, we appreciate it. Anytime. Thanks for having me. All You're right. the best, man. Thanks. And now that Sam has uh, got up and walked away, we can mention the real reason we had him on, because we want an invite to the open bar at St. Elmo's and the PFF party tomorrow night. So, you know, <laughs> do a little bit of a trade-off there. We put you on for 25 minutes, we plug your uh, product, and then you reward us with free shrimp cocktail with extra spicy horseradish sauce and free beer. I'll and be there. That's how we make this thing work. All right, friend of the show, Jordan Reed joins us here on Chargers Weekly. And Jordan, it's been a minute, man. Um, congrats on all your success, and and I know that this is a big week for you. No? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for having me on. It's always a pleasure, and this is like the lead up to Christmas for me. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to get the fellowship with everybody, um, figure out some information about all the prospects, and then just realizing them reaching their dreams is just it's awesome. I guess the difference is you got to work on Christmas. You know? <laughs> right. your, your Christmas is a working day <laughs> right. for you. How much, uh, in your experience, how much changes like between combine, pro day, 
what you're hearing through the interviews. Mm -hmm. how, how much movement realistically do you think you see? And are there position groups that tend to move more than others? Yeah, I mean, with the quarterbacks, you always want to see if they're going to throw or not. And that's more so for our entertainment. Right. Um, you love to see them go out there and be competitive. But the, if they don't throw, it's not really a huge deal to NFL teams just because they understand that the disadvantageous things that could happen with that. I mean, some guys that, they're, that you're throwing to, you maybe have met them for the first time when you're connecting flight coming here. Yeah. So just understanding that there is some advantages to it, but also some, some disadvantages for it as well. And then offensive linemen. I love seeing the offensive linemen going out there and competing, especially in the drills and things of that nature. You get to see who your true leaders are, who's outspoken, who's more so laid back, and um, the DBs as well. You get to see their hips and how fluid they are too. Jordan, what's the lead in this draft in terms of – the position, Chris. We know the quarterbacks. It looks like maybe three go in the top five, but yeah. outside of those three quarterbacks, you know, what are you looking at from uh, a position standpoint and just kind of being the lead of this draft? Offensive tackle, and then also wide receiver. Those are your two positions that are absolutely loaded. And we may not see a defensive guy go inside of the top ten, which is something that we haven't seen wow. in a very long time. So this draft class is really led by the offensive tackles and then also the wide receivers. And I know neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr., they're not performing here, but you're going to get to see plenty of other guys, whether it's a Rome or Dunze, and then some of the other guys, uh, Adnay Mitchell's another from Texas, that we'll get to see a lot as well. So both of those positions I think are going to be the headliner of this class. What do you think the, the likelihood is that, that either J.J. McCarthy or a fourth quarterback ends up working his way into, let's say, well, how about number five where the Chargers are <laughs> sitting? Because I think yeah. that's what Joe Ortiz yeah. would like to see, that the team yeah. would be willing to trade all the way up to five. Do you think that's a, a possibility? And if so, like what kind of percentage of a possibility do you think that is? I think so. Um, I will put it at like 30% okay. right now. But once again, there's always that fourth quarterback that just makes the ascension up the draft board as we go along. And I think J.J. is going to be that guy, especially with him electing to throw, him being young, just turning 21 years old. Uh, in January, and then what I like to call the thrill of the unknown with him, just because there's always those coaches that feel they have the secret ingredients to uncover that next layer of a quarterback development. And JJ's really unproven as a passer. I mean, he played in 28, he had 28 career starts. He only had 12 of where he had 25 or more passing attempts in those. And he's won at the highest of moments that you can think of. But for the Chargers, I think that's going to work in their favor, especially they have five teams right after them that have uh, big holes at quarterback, whether it's the Giants at six, the Falcons at eight, um, and then that stretch of 11 through 13 with the Vikings, the Broncos, and then the Raiders of where they could trade up for a quarterback. So the Chargers are sitting in a really good spot if they want to trade back. There's a lot of needs on this team right now, especially when you're bringing a new GM or a new head coach. And, you know, we talk about the offensive line, the wide receiver, uh, defensively, though, you know, corner is a position that they're going to have to replenish. Um, when you look at this corner class, what are your kind of 20,000-foot view thoughts? And can you get a guy in, in the early second that could be a day-one starter? Yeah, I think so. Now, there's not that Devin Witherspoon and some of the other players that we saw in last year's draft class, but I think the depth through the third round is really good for this outside corner group. And, you mean, you're going to hear names like Cam Hart of Notre Dame that could go somewhere in that top 75. Kyrie Jackson from Oregon is another that could be a third-round pick as well. So the depth of the outside corner class is really good. What about Brock Bowers? Like where it really does seem to be one of the great mysteries. It's yeah. not fair to maybe point to Kyle Pitts as to why you wouldn't take him. But just yeah. when you're grading him, when you're reviewing him just on his talent, you know the Super Bowl picture that's making the rounds of him. Yeah. Nobody yeah. looks good standing next, next to Gronk. <laughs> right. But like, what, what is your evaluation of him? What If you're just doing your vertical, where, where does he fit in? High impact player. And I think he's more so of a receiving tight end as opposed to an inline blocker. So you have to treat Brock like he's strictly a receiver. He's not going to give you a lot of value in line. He's not going to be like George Kittle or anybody like that that's just destroying guys as a run blocker. He's not going to be what I call a plus one for your run game right away. But if you're strictly evaluating him as a receiver, I definitely think he's worthy of a top ten pick. Now, top five. That's a little bit touchy just because you want more so of a player that's going to help you at a premium position. Um, but with Bowers, he's definitely going to help you right away. But with tight end, we've seen so many of those highly drafted guys really fail their first few years in the league. And I think with the Chargers, they need that player that's going to help them right away just because when I think of Jim Harbaugh, I think of somebody that's going to come in and try to change the landscape and the, the culture of that team right away. And I don't know if Bowers is going to do that right away at a premium position. So I'd love to, to follow up because this is – I think it's something that people kind of – I feel like our listeners struggle to kind of reconcile it. 
when you say he's a receiving tight end, I just I think of the dominance of Sam Laporta last year. You mm-hmm. can make the case he was the most important pass catcher on the Lions last year. How is it that that particular position – I'm trying to think of the best way to put it. You know, we think of Travis Kelsey as a receiving tight end. Mm-hmm. How does that impact your football team? How is that like a better – let's just say you're sticking and picking at five. Him as a pass catcher versus Roma Dunze as a pass catcher or Malik Neighbors as a pass catcher. Where is that value because he's a tight end instead of a wide receiver? It, it comes down to the financial specifics of things. <laughs> then. Yeah. Just because when you're taking a tight end inside the top ten, he's probably going to be – Probably in like the top 12 range as far as where he's getting paid, but now we're seeing wide receivers get over you know 25, 30 million dollars a year. So I would rather have that control cost wide receiver right. for four to five years as opposed to the tight end. Now, all those guys are going to contribute right away, but we're talking about the financial specifics of everything. And we know with the Chargers, they're in a cap situation of where they may have to shed some some uh, salaries at some certain positions. They're not in the best cap situation, so I would rather have that wide receiver that has a little bit more high-end talent that's more cost-controlled. Speaking of that cap situation, you look at Edge, Joey Bosa, Khalil Mack, decisions need to be made and, and made soon. Um, kind of a two-part question. Tuli Tui Pelotu yeah. burst it onto the scene. Do you remember what you thought of him last year? I know that when you have to evaluate a ton of guys in 2024, some of that stuff goes out the window. But uh, Tuli first, and then is there another guy in the second, third, fourth round that – you could pair with Thule and be kind of that future. Yeah, I remember evaluating Thule. I loved him a lot. Um, he was really productive his final year at USC. And, I mean, he could have kept all the stuff in his dorm room and right over to the Chargers <laughs> and did, played. That's right. So it was good that he ended up getting drafted by the Chargers. It ended up working out for him. So he was a really good player. And then some defensive ends that I like, uh, Adisa Isaac of Penn State, he's one that I like quite a bit. I think he's one that is going to be a really big tester. And if you're looking more so of a late-round guy, Gabriel Murphy of UCLA. Um, he's one that's a little bit undersized, but he could help right away. Keep too. him home. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the Murphys, only one. <laughs> you feel terrible, but it's just the way uh, yeah. it is. It, you mentioned the defensive, uh, you know, just uh, it's an offensive heavy draft. Does that mean that defense isn't as highly graded for you, or is it just that those groups really stand out this year as opposed to there's a lack of, or is there a lack of edge, interior defensive line, linebacking, corner safety, all that sort of stuff? Yeah, Money, I think um, it's just how good this offensive class is. Um, You have the offensive tackles that are really deep, the wide receivers. We could see as many as seven from each position go in the first round, and then you have the quarterbacks, the top three guys at the top that could probably go one, two, and three at the top of the draft. So I think it's more so just the strength of this offensive class. Now we don't have that high-end rusher like an Aiden Hutchinson or Kayvon Thibodeau in this class, and then we don't have that high-end corner like we saw with Devin Weatherspoon. There's no Sauce Gardner or no Derek Stingley in this class, so there isn't that blue-chip high-end guy on the defensive side, but – This offensive class is really, really good. I think Jim has an advantage in that not only does he have 18 guys here from Michigan at the Combine, but just the Big Ten play, being able to see the guys from Mm -hmm. Penn State and and Ohio State. Um, I'm going to ask this question, I think, throughout uh, the the draft process, but just guys from Michigan that you think could fit on the Chargers right away, knowing the mentor scheme, knowing Jim, and maybe the learning curve not being as big for a rookie because you know those guys. Oh, man, how much time do we have? (laughs) There's a lot. Um, I think Blake Corm could be a really good fit for them. Um, They have a need at running back, depending on what happens with Austin Eckler. But one that I love, if you're looking for a nickel corner, is Mike Senristeel. Mm. He's one of my favorites overall in this draft class. Actually started as a receiver at Michigan, then transferred over to the defensive side. And if there was one player who I thought was the best on Michigan's defense last year and the most consistent, Senristeel, he was absolutely terrific last year. What about, let's go uh, other two levels. How about Chris Jenkins? How about Junior Colson? Like, what about those guys? And Because it seems as though... Maybe Chris lines up for second round. Yeah. Austin Johnson, free agent. Sebastian Joseph Day is gone. You know, you, you have a couple younger guys. Scott Matlock, you, it seems like they're more developmental prospects on this team. Mm-hmm. But interior line's a big need for this team as well. I just feel like, Jordan, we're focused so much on offense because of Justin yeah. Herbert that we're not mm-hmm. realizing how – bad the depth situation is on the defensive side of the ball for this team yeah Jenkins he's a fantastic run defender that's something that you see frequently on tape with him now the pass rush production really wasn't there for him last year but with Michigan's scheme 
And with Minter, they don't really have that high-end rusher that you want to get multiple sacks throughout games. So he's really just holding up at the point of attack, and he's just doing his job. But some of the flash plays that you see for him, you know it eventually is going to click for him. He has the NFL DNA. His dad was a terrific player for the Panthers for a long time. So he's one I think is going to get better over time, but more so of a second-round player. So if they're looking for a day-two defensive tackle, he definitely could be a fit. And Junior Colson, depending on teams or scouts that you talk to, they say he's the best linebacker right. in this draft class. A plug-and-play guy I think is going to be really productive. Safety seems to be a little light in terms of depth uh, in this class. And yeah. obviously it starts with Derwin James in that secondary, but the Chargers do need safety help as well. Is there anybody that, that kind of flashes in those mid-rounds? Yeah, Jaden Hicks from Washington State is one that I like uh, quite a bit. He's one of my favorite safeties. I think I have him as my fifth-ranked safety at the position right now. I don't think there's a first-round guy in this safety class, but second, third, fourth, I think that's where you're going to start to see these players uh, really come off the board quite a bit. So Jaden Hicks would definitely be one. Uh, Tyler Newbin, if they're looking for somebody on day two of Minnesota, he's one that the buzz has kind of fizzled a little bit with him. Um, but I think as we get closer to the process, we're starting to see him be a little bit more visible. He didn't end up playing. He didn't play in the Senior Bowl. Uh, but once he starts to become a little bit more visible, he's going to test here this week as well. I think he's going to really do a good job. One of the things you often hear, you know, Jordan, is it, just your your money rounds are three, four, like right in in there. And I guess it's it, so much of it comes down to evaluation and and what I guess how you evaluate when you are trying to project what you think these players are going to do at the next level. How much of those rounds for you are traits versus production? if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I think it just depends on the position, honestly, just because we've seen defensive ends, a lot of teams take those guys in the second or third round. Maybe they didn't have the production, but they have the traits just because eventually you know it's going to click for them. Like Daniil Hunter is a great example. I right. think he only had like – 10 sacks during his time at LSU, but eventually it ended up clicking for him. So defensive end is more so traits-based, but wide receiver, you want to see those guys be productive just because if you didn't produce in college, you're probably not going to produce right. in the NFL. So I would say it's more so position-specific when you're talking about that. Center, we've talked about uh, yeah. JPJ from, from Oregon. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Zach Frazier that from West Virginia. <laughs> is, is, he, is he number one in your eyes? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think he's the best Is it close? In the, um, I don't think it's going to be after the combine, um, especially how he played after the senior bowl or at the senior bowl too. I think he really distanced himself to being in his own tier. I think his clock probably starts at 16 with the Seahawks. Mm. And then I would be surprised if he got past Dallas at 24. Oh, so wow. I think that's probably where his range is going to end up, but it's a really good center class. Like I like Zach Frazier of West Virginia. I like Cedric Van Pran of Georgia. He's more so probably fourth or fifth round guy. And then also Graham Barton of Duke. He's another that you're going to hear quite a bit about. But there's some depth later on in this center class. Hunter Norzad of Penn State is one name that's created quite a bit of buzz. A Bo Limmer of Arkansas is another name. Probably fourth or fifth round that's created some buzz too. Yeah, it feels like, you know, the way that it's lining up for the Chargers, especially after the press conferences, what Jim Harbaugh had to say, what Joe Ortiz had to say, what Greg Roman then had to say about the run game. In terms of like hitting doubles, like mm -hmm. you don't want. You, I think you said it a little bit earlier. Like you can't afford to whiff. Like it, it's right. It, where are those doubles? Do you think in this in in the in the draft? If that makes sense, is it offensive? Yeah. Like if you're picking at five, would you fear? And even if you trade down to eight or ten, are you more comfortable with the, the a high floor for one of the old linemen, or are you more comfortable with a high floor for one of the wide receivers? Yeah, money. I think it all depends on how they feel about Trey Pipkins. It, what is their true feeling about Trey Pipkins? Do you feel as if he fits your scheme? Can he fit and be in a run-dominant Greg Roman scheme? Also, can he stay healthy, of course? And then what is his projection? Is his projection higher than a Joe Alt or a Olu Fashion or some of these other, Talese Fuaga, some of these other tackles? And if it is not, if you don't feel comfortable with that, I will look to trade back, recoup some of those day two picks, and then trade or excuse me, take a Talese Fuaga or a J.C. Latham or somebody like that. Last one for me, Jordan, and it, it kind of speaks to the running game. You know, the Chargers have drafted guys like Joshua Kelly and Isaiah Spiller in the fourth round, and for whatever reason it hasn't worked out. We haven't seen much of Isaiah Spiller at all um, mm -hmm. with the Chargers, so maybe this is a new era for him as well. But um, in terms of the running back position, they want to kind of retool this, this room. So whether they do mm -hmm. it free agency or the draft – is there a guy or, or a couple of guys that maybe starting in round three or four that you could see as bell cows or guys who could be productive in a Jim Harbaugh system? So I did a Q&A on Twitter the other day, and I'm going to speak this <laughs> position and this player and this team into existence. 
Braylon Allen of Wisconsin and Jim Harbaugh are a match made in heaven <laughs> for each other. Like it's so perfect. I can just see Jim watching film on him, just seeing the six foot two, two hundred and forty five pound, twenty year old running back and just being a sledgehammer yeah. in his offense. I just love the fit. Now you have to pair more so a receiving running back with him just because he's not gonna give you a lot of production as a receiver. But Braylon Allen is just such a perfect fit in Greg Roman's offense, especially with him playing a lot of 12 and 13 personnel, those tight, condensed formations, just him being a sledgehammer in that offense, it's a match made in heaven. It's a Big Ten guy, too. You yeah, know, exactly. a guy that he's played against. <laughs> you know what? How about pairing him with Frank Gore's kid? Yeah. You know? Be perfect. Just uh, Be get perfect. a little, little Frank Gore back on, yeah. the, uh, back on the roster. All right, last one, and we certainly appreciate it, Jordan. Uh, same, same question, really, but just different room, tight end. And we already talked about Brock Bowers, and let's mm -hmm. just take that off the table. Gerald Everett's a free agent. Donald Parham, like when you look at that tight end room, it does look like for what this offense wants to do, probably going to need to be remade. Yeah. Um, just why tight end, even a blocking tight end, what, is, what does that look like in this particular draft? And, and do you see some? And, and maybe it's the Big Ten. Maybe it's Ohio State and Michigan yeah. where you go get those guys. Yeah, um, two guys come to mind that I think Harbaugh is going to like. Theo Johnson of Penn State, um, more so of your – He's kind of a mixture of Y and F tight end. You can move him around a little bit. He's not going to give you a whole bunch as far as a blocker, but uh, receiving production, he had seven receiving touchdowns during this final eight games at Penn State. He came on really late in the bowl game against Ole Miss, too. So he's one. He's actually my third-ranked tight end right now behind Bowers and Jatavian Sanders of Texas. And then um, Theo Johnson I just talked about, and then also – um, I just drew a blank. Theo Johnson is the one <laughs> yeah. uh, that I really like. Uh, he's one. I can't remember the other. I had another yeah. on my mind. But Theo Johnson is one that – oh, it's Kay Stover of Ohio okay. State. I was there thinking of another State. Big Ten guy. Yeah. I was like, who's the other Big Ten guy? But, yeah, Kay Stover of Ohio State is another that I like quite a bit. This yeah. isn't like a Kincaid, Musgrave, Laporta type draft, though, where it's 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 deep like last year, though, is it? Uh, no, I don't think so. It's more so of a pick a flavor that you like with this tight end class. Last year it was a combination of both, and I think – all those guys had high-end traits. You don't see those big-time receiving guys after Bowers and Sanders. It's kind of like, do you want the inline guy? Do you yeah. want the receiving guy? Do you want the one that's more so just going to be a blocking guy? So just depending on what flavor that you like, this really isn't a combination of both or high-end traits in this group. I know we said last thing, but I'm going to add one more because it just came to mind. We've, we've told the story on the pod before that – Jim Harbaugh told when he was hired at San Diego, and he said he, he had a conversation with, with Coach Bo, and, and Bo said, you know, you're going to have a tight end that plays with his hand in the ground? Yes, sir. You're going to have a uh, fullback? Yes, sir. Are you going to run power? Yes, sir. So uh, he said, all right, then you can be a coach. Is there a fullback in this draft? Is there, uh, is there a Ricard that John Harbaugh has in, in Baltimore that Jim can welcome yeah. to the uh, – uh, Lorenzo Neal to, to get that position back yeah. in the good graces of the Bolts? Uh, ben Sonat of Kansas State. All right. uh, who has one of my favorite stories in the draft. So he was a six-sport athlete Six in high school. sport Yeah. He played every single sport that you could think of, and he only had one offer coming out of high school, and it was a D2 school. He ended up walking on at Kansas State, and he built himself up over time, started off as a fullback, transitioned to more so of an H type of tight end to where he can move him around quite a bit. But if you want him to be that sledgehammer and lead in the formation, he can do that. You want him playing hip of the offensive tackle, he can do that as well. So Ben Sanat definitely is one. Okay. You know what? I got one more. <laughs> <laughs> there we, we go. We go all day. <laughs> one more. Just because uh, I called a ton of Stanford games when, when Jim Harbaugh was there, and Owen Marisic was one of my favorite players, obviously. And we don't get a lot of two-way guys. Are there any two-way players in the draft? Um, yeah. So Siani Vaca from Utah. Utah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah there yeah, we yeah. go. Yeah. yeah. I like him better as a running back. They right. played him at safety at Yeah, Utah. they played him at safety. Oh, he but destroyed I, I, USC yeah. when he was running oh, the ball. Man. Destroyed him. Oh, I think he's going to be awesome. Yeah. Um, I would play him as a running back. There we and go. And I think he's one player that we look back on this draft, you're going to be like, man, why wasn't he drafted higher? It's there like everybody's looking at him as a safety. He should have been a running back the <laughs> exactly. entire time. So he's one. Well, Beautiful. He's got, he's got the answers to the test, man. I know, of course he does. That's, <laughs> why we're, that's why I'm comfortable peppering him. Some guys I won't pepper. Jordan, we can pepper. It. We feel Dude, good about it. You're the best. And this is what fans love, names, right? Names yeah. that they can like look at over the next couple of months, do some research on, and, and actually watch during the combine and, and see, okay, this could this be a future Charger? Yep. A lot of Big Ten guys, though. I hear Penn State, I hear Wisconsin. I'm like, all right, Jim knows these dudes, you know, independent yep. of just Michigan. So, hey, uh, you're the best. Thank, Thank you, you so guys, much, man. As always. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you. So, money out of the gate, Jordan and Sam. Fantastic interviews, a nice kickoff to the week. Yeah, and, you know, today we had all the head coach and all the, the GM pressers. So, tomorrow – 
will be a little bit more player centric. All the groups will be in town, uh, either going through their medicals, their team interviews, all of those sort of things. And, and we'll do, uh, I think, you know, continue to do our deep dive onto this draft class. You know, Nate Tice going to join us tomorrow from The Athletic, does a great job breaking down film. We'll have Lance Zerline. Nobody does better with offensive line than, than Lance. And interestingly enough, both of those guys, their dads, uh, legendary offensive line coaches yeah. in the NFL. We'll have both of them. We've already reached out to uh, a number of other folks as well. Jeremy Surprises Fowler. are coming. Exactly. You know, I, I won't even mention names. Surprises are coming. we got a lot of folks that will end up joining us. So be sure to, uh, to, again, it's not just one day. It's not just two. We're going to end up having three pods this week from the Combine. So be sure to check in Wednesday and Thursday. Yeah. Uh, adjust your schedules accordingly. Charges Weekly, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday this week. Uh, we will be back Wednesday. Uh, for Buddy, I'm Chris. This has been Chargers Weekly from the Combine and Indy. We'll see you next time.